we suffer more in our heads than in actual reality. Does that make sense, boy? It's a bit hard to grasp. Oh, hey, welcome back. I've been meaning to talk to you about something. It's a little thing called stoicism. Let's go. Welcome back, everyone. Tonight, I'm going to be chatting you up about a guide to the good life. The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy by William B. Irvine. It is a really cool read. I heard about this author from the Waking Up app. It's a meditation app that I use and I can't recommend it enough. And Irvine has a series on there called The Stoic Path and I really enjoyed that. So I figured I'd crack this open and see where it led me and I'm glad I did because it's a real doozy. I'm going to focus on the first half of the book because I found it much more helpful and inspiring than the latter half, which was a little bit confusing at times and a bit muffled. So I just found that the first half provided actual concrete steps to take if you're interested in at least partially following the wisdom of the Stoics. I am hoping by the end of the video, I'll have been able to give you one or two practical things you can use to make the daily slog a little bit more tolerable, if you will. So in terms of Stoicism, I didn't really know anything about it before reading, hence wanting to read the book, but I always thought of a Stoic person as emotionally stunted or void of emotion, and I guess that isn't too far off because the actual definition, or at least in the book, is defined as one who is seemingly indifferent or unaffected by joy, grief, pleasure, or pain. So good old Willie explains that this is a common opinion to hold and that most people who hear the word stoic think the same thing that I did and even William admitted that he thought the same when he started out practicing and he just wanted to make it clear in the book that the goal of a stoic is to suppress negative emotions and to keep our expectations in check. That doesn't mean we can't be an exuberant and lively person. It just means that our objective is to be impervious to negative feelings. The philosopher Epictetus said, your primary desire should be your desire not to be frustrated by forming desires you won't be able to fulfill. So, in other words, instead of trying to spend our lives chasing after clout or fame or trying to feel superior to the next person, we should aim to chase a life of tranquility, as that is marked by an absence of negative emotions, a.k.a. needless suffering. Quote, we are unhappy in large part because we are insatiable. I think this means that we feel bored once we acquire what we desire, which in turn causes us to desire grander things and accomplish more challenging goals. This could be attributed to the fact that in terms of our evolution, the state of being content and satisfied is synonymous to letting our guard down and opens us up to potential threats. We were always on the move and it wasn't even possible to just sit back and watch the grass grow. We always had to keep moving to find greener pastures. Our apparent inability to be fulfilled by positive changes, big and small, is a phenomenon called hedonic adaptation. I'm sure everyone can relate to being elated over something that they thought would be life-changing, only to take it for granted days or even hours later. Appreciation is quickly replaced by acclimation. In my late 20s, all I wanted was a dog, a car, and a nicer apartment. Now that I have all of these things, I find myself questioning if this is actually what I wanted all along. Now that I have the stability that I craved, and I'm not happy every single day, I'm often wondering if being a free-willing nomad would have been more up my alley. The reality is, if we are constantly wondering if we should have went left instead of right, we will be miserable for the entirety of our lives. I think most of us think that if we won the lottery, we would never complain another day in our life, but I'm sure that inevitably uh, a whole new set of challenges would arise and we would be stressed out by the new obstacles in our new lives as a pretentious rich person, annoyed that we're not getting the finest whiskey or the best seat at the opera or whatever rich people do, I'm not really sure. But oh, how nice that would be to be rich. 
all the things I could do. A big part of being a practicing Stoic involves engaging in something called negative visualization. This term alone may seem counterintuitive and almost as if we're toying with the idea of nihilism, but the author claims that the practice can yield extremely positive results. The whole idea behind this meditative exercise, I guess you could call it, is to take the sting off encountering a miserable situation and making it manageable. Due to hedonic adaptation, like I mentioned before, we take a lot of things for granted, leaving limitless room for us to obsess over what we don't have. So with negative visualization and considering what our life would be like if we lost everything, for example, we start to appreciate our our small victories more and relearn to love what we have. This isn't to say that we should obsess over morbid things and every time we look at our friend we think, I'm happy that Susie hasn't died in a tragic accident today. That's not really the goal, or to walk into our apartment and think this whole place could burn to the ground because this may really quickly turn into anxiety. I think rather we should focus on using the visualization as a tool in the moments when we're starting to feel entitled and thankless. The objective should be to use it as a contemplative tool, not a compulsive one. An example Irvine Irving provides in the book is merely to just remind yourself on a daily basis that those who you care about, or anyone at all, including yourself, are just mere mortals and every encounter, it could be your last time with them. And I'm sure you've heard that advice many times before, but I don't think it can be repeated enough. And I just think that when you go into communication with that type of attitude with people, you're going to create a positive environment and that energy will permeate throughout the whole conversation and just create a atmosphere where you're probably going to leave with no regrets and just appreciate that you were able to ground yourself in that moment. Of course it's not feasible for us to do this every day and nor would I recommend it just bouncing into work and be like can you believe we're alive another day guys? I think uh, there might be a meeting with HR pretty quickly after that. It's a little bit too much zest but having said that we should really just try to be cognizant of the transience of life and how to best appreciate it and help others to do the same whenever you can simply. One of the cornerstones of stoicism is control and how you can only focus on yourself and not other people and how it's illogical to have a reaction to other people's immoral behavior and it will only hurt you in the long run, which is true. I mean, my goal in 2023 is just to let it be, go with the flow. That's very contrary to my baseline personality, but once you make the conscious decision to detach yourself from other people's ignorance, it's quite monumental. No one's perfect, but I would say just even this week or today, try to challenge yourself just to be unflappable see what happens. There's a whole chapter dedicated to internal versus external goals and explaining the difference and if you're interested in receiving advice on things that Stoics believe that you have control over versus no control over, it would be worth checking out. Ancient Roman Stoics believed in fatalism and that the gods were controlling everything so you could always use that hack if you feel as though life isn't going your way just because you can't control your destiny, you can just kind of wash your hands of everything. Hashtag wasn't my fault. Hashtag no free will. There's one part of the book I thought was a little odd where the author says that it's advisable to stay away from other people who don't have similar values because it may corrupt your stoic mind. And I thought this was pretty incongruent with the idea of stoicism as a whole since I thought the whole point was to be immune to anything that comes your way and that includes other people's attitudes, I would assume. So I was a little bit perplexed by that. Can't we all just get along? There was a whole chapter on insults and how to handle them, which was pretty wild because one of the insights, and I quote, when you're insulted, consider whether what the insulter said was true. If it is, there's little reason to be upset. For example, if someone mocks us for being bald and we are in fact bald, why is it an insult? 
Sounds like a riddle. So next time, unfortunately, if someone is bullying you and the shoe fits and the facts match, you're out of luck. You got no recourse. What did you call me? Chunky? Well, I, I guess I... To conclude, if you feel like the Stoic Path could be something you'd like to follow or are slightly interested in, just get the book, if not for the chapter on insults alone. But remember, an important part of being a Stoic is not to let anyone know that you're a Stoic, because the point is to walk the walk, not talk the talk. So mum's the word. For those of you who I know are dying to know if I'm a stoic in sheep's clothing, the jury's out. I guess you'll never know. Except you will because I'm not. Barring some miracle from the Greek gods above, I know that if the sky is falling, instead of gracefully accepting it with my arms wide open, I'm gonna run like hell. And the sky falls. And then they crumble. And then they crumble. We will stand tall. But we will stand tall. Yeah.